We have to thank you everyone for joining us tonight. It's challenging as a Talmud to talk about my Rebbe, Rav Soloveitchik, and especially because anything he touched, any sugya in Torah, whether it be Torah Shabbat Sav, whether it be the Kriya Torah for that week, whether it be the Haftorah, whether it be the Gemara that he was teaching, and he taught many Gemaras even at the same time. He had what I call the magic touch. He would always find a chidush, some insight into whatever he was studying. And therefore, it's impossible. You'd have to fill up an entire library with his insights, with his chidush. What I tried to do for tonight was to focus on the area of his public lectures, his drushos, and his writings, his essays. And we'll have to leave out, to some extent, what I consider the main part of his contribution, and that is his lumdus, his insights into sugis. But my contention is that the methodology that Rav Salvechik used and applied to lumdus was also, from his perspective, the same way of thinking, the same methodology that he applied to all hashkaf issues, to attitudes, to contemporary life. So we will get to touch Yemir Tzachem on his methodology as we go along. I want to begin with the following observation, something that he said over and over again. And that is that principles of faith and philosophy and metaphysics are only important because they give us a way of life. Our challenge is to take these concepts, these prepositions, these de definitions of God and his universe and transform them, convert them into moral principles. And I'd like to give a few examples of how this works. First of all, we say that God created the universe, yesh me'ayin ex nihilo. No one could really comprehend ex nihilo. How do you create something out of nothing? We live in a physical world of science, of cause and effect, the natural world. And this concept of ex nihilo, God as creator, is something that defies human comprehension. There's no way we can explain it philosophically. But the challenge is to convert the concept of creation into a moral challenge for each and every one of us. The Torah tells us, otherwise known as imitatio deo, we have to imitate God. And if God is a creator, then we are called upon to be creators. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But beyond that, the basic principle of Jewish morality comes from creation. And why is that so? David HaMelech says in Tehillim, Lashem Ha'aretz and Meloah, the entire universe is Lashem. Lashem means God possesses, he owns everything. It's all his. And why? The Pasa continues, Ki hu al yamim yisada, because he created the world. And this reflects a principle in halacha, in Jewish law, which is reflected in the Gemara about Metziah, and that is called Kenyon Maisi Yodayim. Here's the case. I bring raw materials to an artisan. He shapes it, he forms it, he creates a final product. I gave him the raw materials, which were mine, but he, through his own creation, what we call Maisi Yodayim, he now returns to be an object which is worth 
multiple times more than the original raw materials. But before he gives me the object back, who owns this object? And the Gemara quotes two opinions. One opinion says, Uman Kona Bishvat Keli, that the artisan possesses that which he created because it's his creation, a new Kenya, a new method of acquiring ownership. It's mine, I created it, and therefore I own it. The other man, the armor says, no. Ain't Uman Kona Bishvat Keli, because there's nothing substantially, he just changed and, and reshaped the, the raw materials and therefore it doesn't belong there. But when it comes to ex nihilo, everybody agrees. There's no machlokas, as we say in the Gemara language, it's unanimous that uman konigashvach keli, that man, and in this case God, create something and he owns that which he created because no one's giving God the raw materials. It's a product of ex nihilo, of yesh me'ayin. If there's no raw materials to begin with, God creates something, then it's his by virtue of the principle of uman konovich fach This is a tremendous moral axiom which really forms the backbone of all of Jewish morality. Everything that we think we own, we really don't own. Maybe it's on loan, but it really belongs to Hashem because Hashem Haaretz and Maloa. Everything belongs to Him. It's fascinating that in the Ne'ilah service, which is perhaps the apex of all our davening on Yom Kippur, if you take a look, there's one phrase that repeats itself twice. There's no vidui. We don't go into the long enumeration of sin, but we say, Laman Yechdal Me Oshek Yodenu. What is Oshek Yodenu? We have to desist from thievery, from stealing. What's that all about? Why is it that in the holiest day of the year and the apex of all our prayers, we're going to recite confession for the sin of robbery? Who robbed anything? You know, we have X number of people davening in Ashul on Rosh Hashanah. Look around. I don't see any thieves there in the audience. I mean, I hope not. But the answer is that whenever we misuse, whenever we abuse any talents, any thoughts, any part of our body, we are, we are stealing from Hashem. This is an embezzlement. This is called me'ilah. Why is it called me'ilah? The concept of me'ilah means when I steal something from Hagrid, something that's sanctified. Why is it that whenever I take something from this world without having rights to do so, whenever I violate the will of God, I am considered Oshek Yodenu as if I stole something. And from what? From whom did I steal it? From Hegdesh. Why? Because Lashem Ha'aretzim Lord. The word Lashem in Halacha means Hegdesh. Let's say, for example, I own this table and I want to sanctify for Hegdesh and now I transfer ownership over to Hegdesh. I say Lashem Shulchan Zer. Lashem Karma. Everything in this universe belongs to God. It's all his. And if we misuse it, if we take it for our own benefits when we're not licensed to do so, we are guilty of thievery, of robbery, of oshek. All sin really comes down to one sin, and that is oshek. And therefore, for example, the Gemara says in Brachos, if I want to enjoy the benefit of a food, then I have to recite a bracha. If I don't recite a bracha, sadmenim, then I'm a moel. I have taken something from Hegnish because God owns everything. And when we say God owns everything, we mean literally everything. Our thoughts, our talents, our energies, our speech, everything belongs to the Almighty God. This is the fundamental principle of Jewish morality. And it all begins with a philosophical concept of God creating the universe, yesh me'ayin. But there's another moral principle that I indicated before. And once again, we're taking a fundamental principle of faith and converting it into a moral principle. And that is that man is called upon to imitate God. And if God is a creator, then man has to be a creator. How does man become a creator? 
So one of Rav Salvechik's famous essays is called Halachic Man, Ish Halacha. And if I had to pinpoint the central theme, there are many themes to that essay, but the most prominent theme is man as a creator. When a person sits down and studies Torah, he becomes a creator. In his own way, in a very unique individual way, he understands that sugya, and it's a chidush. It's creative. We are not meant to just recite the Torah by rote, you know, just read it on a superficial level. We delve deep into it. And with profound insights, we become creators. We now have imitated God as a creator. The Medrash tells us, in the name of Rabbi Avo, at the beginning of Chumash, that God, listen carefully, bara olamos v'chrivan. He created many worlds. The world that we're looking at is not the only world that God created, and God destroyed these worlds. I mean, I have one question. I don't know why this was the best of all the experiments, but that's a different issue. What am I meant to learn? What moral principle do I derive? What responsibility can be placed on my shoulders when I learn, Rabbi Avo, that God created many worlds, multiple worlds, and destroyed them until he finally created this world? And to give you a dramatic answer to that question, we'll take Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva is known, of course, as the eternal optimist. In the later part of his life, as you and I know, he lost 24,000 Talmudim. Who could even imagine what a catastrophe, what mourning and grief Rabbi Akiva went through when his life's work had come to a termination. But Rabbi Akiva pushed on. He didn't throw up his hands and give up hope. He started teaching Torah and raising a new generation. And he had five Talmudim from which the Torah was able to exist. Every one of us experiences in our lives losses, defeats, and what is our response? We have to be like God. Even if we have to be machrev, we have to give up on different enterprises and projects that were so important to us. Nevertheless, we have to start all over again with a new sense of energy. Learning from our Kodesh Baruch Hu to imitate God who created many worlds. In the story of creation, the Torah tells us for Aretz I saw so vavo. There was chaos. Why is it important for you and I to know this? It's such a metaphysical principle about chaos, about tov vavo, about void. But the answer is again to translate this into a moral responsibility. We are responsible to banish and overcome all of Tov Avo in this universe. And that means that we have to create a civilization. We have to create technology. If we need bridges to cross rivers and oceans, that's what we have to do. And perhaps most important, we have to educate. The mind and the spirit of a young child is Tov Avo. It really is chaos, it has no structure. But when we teach a child, we form him or her, and we are in effect taking tov avo and make it into something of structure, something of purpose. That's the responsibility. So man has to conquer disease, he has to control rivers, he has to heal the sick, he has to alleviate suffering. All this is man's challenge to overcome tov avo and be creative. If you look at Jewish history, all of Jewish history is a repetition of this same process over and over again. We built a community in Babylonia, and then we were sent to exile, and we restructured, and we went to Spain, and we were expelled from Spain, we got to Poland, we got to Germany. And each time the Jewish people suffering the losses and the expulsions that they did. They came back and recreated a Jewish society, a Jewish community. That's making something creative out of Tovavon.
as I said at the outset, what's fascinating about studying the attitudes, the Ashkafot, the philosophies of Rav Soloveitchik is that he utilizes the Lumdish terminology, the methodology of Lumdus to analyze Sukhis and Shas, and he applies them here in the area of Hashkaf. And anyone who knows anything about the Soloveitchik dynasty, and we're going back now to Rav Soloveitchik's grandfather of Chaim Brisker, it's all about Svein Dinen. Two different laws. You know, you take a law and you break it down into its component parts. You talk about two dimensions. You talk about comparing two concepts and showing the contrast between them. They seem similar on the surface, but they're fundamentally different. This is the essence of the Derech Halimud, the methodology of Brisk, of Reb Chaim. And Rav Soloveitchik took this structure and this methodology and he applied it over and over again to the areas of Jewish thought and Jewish ethics. Let me mention a few examples. In the Torah, there are two words that sound identical. Eda and Machan. And Rav Soloveitchik told us over and over again that they're fundamentally different. A, ma- a Machane is formed when a community is made up of individuals, all of whom have a common enemy. So they gather together for practical reasons, for self-defense. That's a machna. Ada is a whole different concept. Ada means a community, the members of which have a common metaphysical goal. They have ideals, they have beliefs, they have a spiritual agenda. And that, the word Ada comes from the word aid, which means testimony. And there's a testimony, an edus, like the Lufos edus. And we are all together dedicated to work towards the goal of that edu. Another example. The Gemara tells us in Mesech the Megillah, Mevatlim Talmud Torah, the Mikra Megillah. For example, I have a Chavrusa at a certain time, but it's time to hear the Megillah. So the Gemara tells me I have to be Mevatl my Torah, stop learning for the sake of hearing the Megillah. But the question is obvious. Why is that called Bittul Torah? Megillus Esther is one of the 24 books of the Kisvei HaKodesh. It's also Torah. So when I read the Megillah, when I hear the Megillah, I am fulfilling a mitzvah Talmud Torah. Why is this called Bittul Talmud Torah? But the answer is that Talmud Torah can be studied on two different levels. There's one level of reading Torah Shabbat Sav. I may or may not understand what I'm reading, but it's meaningful. And Torah Shabbat Sav incorporates all the books of Kisvei HaKodesh. A man reads Tehillim. He doesn't understand a word of what he's reading. He's Makayim of Mitzvah because Tehillim is Torah Shabbat Sav. But then there's another level of learning, of study. That's called Torah Shabbat Peh. Torah Shabbat Peh requires study, requires understanding. It's not Kriya, it's Havana. If I don't understand what I'm reading, if I read a Mishnah, it's meaningless. To read a Mishnah without understanding it is Torah Shabbat Peh. It doesn't have a cue. The Vatlin Talmud Torah means that since there are different levels, there's a hierarchy of Talmud Torah. When you read the Megillah, yes, for sure you get a cue of Talmud Torah. You fulfill that mitzvah. But it's on one level. And vis-a-vis a higher level, when you could be learning a sugya with your chavruz and plunging to the depths of that sugya, then you are mavatal that level of Talmud Torah. Rav Soloveitchik is very famous for an essay, which is called The Lonely Man of Faith. How many people in the audience, by the way, have ever heard of the book called The Lonely Man of Faith? Okay, I see if, okay, that's not too bad. I was hoping more heads would go up. But in any event, in The Lonely Man of Faith, the structure of which is an analysis of two chapters at the beginning of Sefer Bracious, Bracious Aleph and Bracious Bays, Two different descriptions of the creation of man and, and Eve, of Adam and Chava. Rav Soloveitchik develops an entire structure called Adam the first and Adam the second. And once again, you will see the manifestation and the application of the Brisker methodology in Adam the first and Adam the second. It's a trade dinam, if you will. Two dimensions of man, two types of relationships between man and fellow men, between man and his wife, 
his wife and her, and, and her husband. And on one level, on a more superficial level, Adam the first gathers together with, with Chava, with his wife, on a level of let's be part, let's work towards a common goal. But on a deeper level, which is Adam the second, we're talking about a more profound metaphysical relationship that touches on the infinite of two people that enter into a bris relationship together, a covenant, the Hoyul of Basarecha to become one. Another example <coughs> of these two different levels, the superficial level and the deeper level. In one of Rav Salvechik's discussions with us during a seer, when we finished a certain parak, he spoke about two relationships between a Rav and his Talmud. On one level, the Rav is teaching the Talmud information. He's pumping as much information as he can into the mind of his Talmud. But the Rebbe and the Talmud remain two separate entities, two separate personalities, independent one of the other. On a more profound level, the Rebbe and the Talmud merge into one personality. The eye awareness, to use a term from existential philosophy, if you heard of Martin Buber and so forth, the eye awareness of the Rebbe includes the Talmud and vice versa. It's like they become one, they become united. Rav Soloveitchik spoke about the sanctity of every Jew on two different levels. Again, an application of Tzvayim Dinah. There's one Kedusha which is called Kedusha Sa'avos. I'll explain. Another Kedusha is Kedusha Atmos. The Torah tells us in Parshas Re'eh that God chooses us as a nation and then it says Rashi. Rashi says that the beginning of the passage refers to Kedusha Sheyarashta Mina Avos, the sanctity of every Jew that he inherits from our forefathers. And then Rashi says, Hashem. Rashi says, Kedushas Atzmacha. This is your own private personal Kedusha. On the one hand, every Jew, insofar as he's a Jew, inherits that sanctity as being part of the Kedushas Avos. And even a ger, a convert, enters into that bris of Kedusha Sa'avos because Avram Avinu is the father of ger. But then there's another level. Don't let a person sit back on his laurels and say, well, I have the sanctity and I'm uplifted as a member of the Jewish community because I am an offspring, a descendant of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. No, 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 no. There's another level of Kedusha, and that's very subjective. It depends on each individual. That's Kedushas Atzmacha. And the more a person works in a profound way to elevate himself, to study Torah on the deepest level, he now creates a new level of Kedusha for himself. That's Kedushas Atzmacha. That's his own private Kedusha. You know, we have two brachos that we recite in the morning in the Birchas Hashacha that sound almost identical. One is Gvura, right? Ozi Yisrael the Gvura. And the other is Koach, No Sein Layoif Koach. Both Gvura and Koach in the English translation might be identical synonyms. Rav Salvechik said absolutely not. Koach is on the physical level. We are tired, we are fatigued. We wake up in the morning sometimes, we didn't have enough sleep the night before. And we ask Hashem and we praise Hashem. No say layoif ka. That's physical power. But on a deeper level, it's Ozer Yisrael big Gvura. Gvura is a metaphysical quality of man that gives an individual an ability to overcome temptations, challenges, to surmount all the boundaries and impediments of life. That's Gvura on a much more profound level. Rav Soloveitchik in his public lectures very often would tirade against those who would use common sense to understand the Torah and the halach of the Jewish law. He would always insist that Jewish law has logic, it's logical, but it has a logical system of its own, not to be identified with secular Western logic. 
So you can take a course today in almost any university in logic. It's mostly mathematical symbols. And you could be an expert in logic. But that doesn't mean that you'll understand the logic of the Torah. The logic of the Torah is very unique. And it's a self-contained independent system. For example, a Kalvachomer. We think a Kalvachomer is just very simple and logical, but a Kalvachomer has to fit into many, many different rules and regulations. Throughout Jewish history, unfortunately, there were Jews who didn't get the message. They didn't understand and appreciate that Allah and Jewish law operates with its own methodology, its own logical system. And perhaps the most profound example of that in the Torah itself is Korach. Rav Salvechik used to call Korach the common sense rebellion. After all, Korach had arguments, and all his arguments were built on common sense. If one string of tcheles would patter up an entire garment for tzitzis, then why if you have a garment full of tcheles, and the entire garment is made of tcheles, why do I have to add another, another string, and so forth and so on, mezuzah, and all the different logical arguments they put forward? But what Korach failed to recognize, he did not acknowledge the unique logic of the Torah of Allah. He was applying common sense logic. And this is something that we've suffered from throughout the generations, all the different movements that rose up against traditional Judaism. It was all based on this rebellion of Korach, of the common sense rebellion. What is our relationship to Goyim? to the non-Jewish community. I have here in front of me a wonderful book, which is called Reflections of the Rav, and it was compiled by Rav Avram Bezdin al He has two volumes. This is the first volume. And he quotes Rav Salavechik, who tries to understand Avram Avinu's statement at the beginning of Parashas Chaisara, Ger v'toshav anochi machem. Ger is a stranger. Toshav is a citizen a local person who lives in that community. Avram Avinu is saying something and the opposite. He's describing himself on the one end as a ger, and on the other end as a tosha. Well, what is it? Let's have it. Are you a ger or a tosha? And once again, using the methodology of Tzvei of two dimensions, there are two dimensions to our relationship to the non-Jewish world. On the one end, we are a tosha. We live in the community that we live in, wherever it is on the face of the globe, and we are upstanding citizens. The Gemara tells us, Dina de Balchusa Dina. We are obliged to follow the law of the land. Not only that, the Gemara tells us, heavy mis- a mission of us, heavy mispalel bishlomash of Malchus. We have to pray on behalf of the welfare of the state. A Jew has to understand and appreciate, says Rav Salvech, that he is part of mankind. He is part of the human race. And as such, he must bear that responsibility and share that burden of contributing to the welfare of the state. But on the other hand, a Jew is always a ger. He has his own commitments. He is part of a nation of bris. He has visions. When Rothschild died in France, anyone who knows the first thing about France will tell you it's a very nationalistic country. And Rothschild was known in the highest circles of political echelon when Charles de Gaulle was the premier of France. And he left a tzava, a a last will and testament that his remains should be brought to Israel and buried there. And de Gaulle made the following statement. I thought Rothschild was a loyal citizen of France. As if to say that because he wanted to be buried in in Israel, therefore he's not a loyal Frenchman. A Frenchman has to be buried in France. And Rav Soloveitchik would always warn us to be very careful about the influence of the Goyim and the society that we find ourselves in. Yes, we will walk together with them. We will help contribute to conquer all the difficulties and the diseases and we have made contributions, unbelievable the Jewish contributions to every society throughout the Jewish long, bitter, gullous exile. But we can walk hand in hand with the Goyim and the political echelon up until a certain point. 
when they manifest immorality, when they are intolerant, when they are cruel, when they violate Jewish morality, at that point, we part ways. And with regard to the issue, I don't know if you remember this, called ecumenism, when the church wanted to invite the Jewish leaders, you know, to join in, in their study of, of, of joint, you know, the common religion that, you know, that connects the two great religions. Of salvation was very cold to that idea. He was unexcited about it. He wrote a letter to the Pope. By the way, if you're writing a letter to the Pope, what language did you write it in? The Rav wrote a 90-page letter to the Pope. In what language? Latin. The Pope didn't know Latin. You have to have somebody translate the letter for <laughs> The essence of the letter was that we have our own religion. We can be common with the, with the non-Jews in certain secular, you know, contribute, you know, agendas and, and enterprises and goals. But when it comes to religion, you know, we, we, we have our own religious Weltanschauung. I know there's a young man here from Boston, so he'll no doubt confirm what I say. The Rav was a patriot. I remember a shia that he gave us. I still remember the name of the sugya, Cheska Sabatin, Sada Zu and Sada Sta. The Rav couldn't figure out Pshat. Hour after hour after hour after hour, four hours and a half. We're sitting there. The rub is racking his brains, trying to figure out the child for four and a half hours. The only problem is it was Thanksgiving. So when the rub finally threw in the towel, he says, all right, go home and eat your turkey. <laughs> the rub was very proud of America. I'm not sure what he would say today, but he was very proud of America. By the way, this is off the records. He voted. Anybody know what he it was known? All the Jews voted Democrat. <laughs> Not all of them. Rav, the Rav voted Republican. Anyway, that's another discussion. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about the Rav's attitude towards women in general, the Jewish woman, Talmud Torah for women. He has a beautiful eulogy for his Mechutenister, the Tolna Rebetzin. It's a masterpiece. Uh, it's one of the only sperm I couldn't bring in tonight because I couldn't find it. But he speaks about the Jewish woman. And in the context of this eulogy, he talks about his own mother, Pesha, and his father, Ramosha. And he says the following. I'll give you an example of what he called Torah Simech, this Torah Sabicha, and that tradition, and that Mesorah that's transmitted from father to son. And then it's Torah Simech. The tradition, it has to be transmitted from a mother to her children. And he gave the example of Shabbos. And he said, if I want to know anything about Shabbos, if I want to understand any Moloch, there are 39 categories of labor with intensely complicated nuances of Alochas, I have to ask my father. My father will tell me and enlighten me about the, the details of how to observe the Shabbos. But if I want to experience the Shabbos, if I want to feel uplifted by the spirit of Shabbos, that I get from my mother, he said. And he applied this to the Tolna Rebbe. I remember when he spoke about Chai Sara and he spoke about Sara Imenu. He pointed out that Sara Imenu was the paradigm of a Jewish mother. And she connected and integrated so many different elements. She had the youth of prayer. We know that young people are and especially young, very young people are able to pray. And in that sense, she was like a seven-year-old. She had the beauty of a 20-year-old and the wisdom of a 100-year-old. She combined and integrated everything that makes up a Jewish woman. And Rav Salvechik took a strong stand about teaching Torah to women when it wasn't popular to allow and encourage Women to study Torah Shabbat. Very controversial issue. The Rav used to say, I can't understand. The women 
are studying secular knowledge on a graduate level, on a postgraduate level, and they don't know anything about a piece of Gemara? How could that be? And the Rav personally molded a high school in Boston, everybody knows this, from Maimonides, in which they taught Gemara to the women. Rav Soloveitchik has a central concept in his hashkafa, in his worldview that he repeats over and over again, especially in safe vibrations. And that is the covenantal community. I don't know if you've ever heard, it. it's very famous for those who are familiar, even from a distance to Rav Salvation's insights. The covenantal community requires a commitment. On the one hand, the Almighty entering into this covenant, into this bris, makes a commitment. The commitment is that God will protect the Jewish people. That ultimately, <laughs> there will be a redemption. But in a bris, in a covenant, like in any contractual agreement, there has to be a commitment on both sides. And we, the Jewish people, are committed through the covenantal community to raise our children, to follow in the path of their fathers and their grandfathers. Rav Salvation used to always point out that we are called B'nai Yisrael. Yisrael is the third of the Avos, Yaakov of him. Why are we called the name of Yaakov? And he would point out that Yaakov was the only one of the three Avos who taught Torah to his grandchildren, to Ephraim and Benashim. We don't know that Avram Avinu sat and learned to blot Gemara with Yaakov Avinu. But we do know that the children of Yosef in Mitzrayim were disciples of their grandfather of Yaakov. And this is what Knesset Yisrael is all about. Our secret weapon is the transmission of Torah, what we call the Mesora of Torah. In Brisk, in Salvechik family, that whole sky and Everything is about the Mesorah. When you transmitted Torah from your Rebbe, from your father, from your grandfather, it had to be transmitted exactly the way you heard it. They say about Rav Baruch Ber Leibovitch, who was a Talmud Muvak of Rav Chaim, that when he would say over the Shia that he heard from his Rebbe Rav Chaim, he would pull up his pants exactly where Rav Chaim pulled up his pants. It's a little embarrassing to say this, but there was, that was the Mesorah. You know, you had to imitate your Rebbe. I remember the Rav said that according to the Ramban, Kriya Satora is a Chovas Tzibu. It's an obligation incumbent on the entire community. It's not a Chovas Yochid on me, but rather on the community. And then he would add that Rav Chaim disagreed and Rav Chaim held that Kriya Satora is a Chovas Yochid. And the Rav following in the footsteps of his grandfather, Rav Chaim, would insist that when he landed in Boston, they landed from Boston in New York, that they would read the Torah for him. And we got together a minion because he was in transit, he couldn't hear the Torah. So somebody asked the Rav, where is this Ramban? How do I find the Ramban? So the Rav said, listen carefully, I'll say it the way he would say it, we don't know where the Ramban is. He heard this Ramban from Reb Chaim or from his father Reb Moshe, and we don't know where the Ramban is. So Rabbi Blau told me, I don't know if you know Rabbi Yosef Blau, that he found the Ramban, and he waited until the Rav would get back to the Sugya. He had to wait a few years. When the Rav came back to the Sugya, the Rav said, we don't know where the Ramban is. So Rabbi Blau opens up the Gemara Megillah to the Rif, and he he was too scared to say anything, but he just pushed it in front of the Rav. So the Rav closed the Gemara. He says, we don't know if the Ramban is. <laughs> it's part of a Mesorah. But what am I trying to convey to you? This commitment and loyalty to the Mesorah. I don't know, Aaron, is there, if, if I would uh, shut off my phone, then everything dies, right? Okay, so I guess it keeps ringing. I don't know. Anyway. So what can I tell you about the Mesorah? Let me say a few things that Rav Salvechik used to teach us, and he used to try to 
you know, like knock it into our brains. We have in every Masechta many debates between Beis Hillel and Beis Shama. Who do we paskin like? In a machlokas between Beis Hillel and Beis Shama, I like Beis Hillel, correct? Now, once we paskin like Beis Hillel, we reject Beis Shama. In fact, the Lushen of Chazal is, you know, Mishnah's Beis Shama, it's a Beis Hillel, ain't a Mishnah. So what happens when I'm studying a sugya? And I'm delving and working hard with tremendous effort to understand both Beis Hill and Beit Shama. Does it mean, heaven forbid, that when I'm studying Beit Shama, I'm not learning Torah? So the Rav said that there are two dimensions to the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. There's what's called a Cheftzichel Torah, and there's a Chovas Gav. This is a classic brisker lump. It's the difference between the object and the subject, which is so basic to any philosophical system. When you're talking about a chovas gavra within the context of Talmud Torah, I have to open up a Shulchan Aruch and I have to figure out what are my responsibilities as a Jew. And here I will find the Shita of Basila. However, as far as the entity of Torah, as a Heftachal Torah, Beit Shammai is no less a Heftachal Torah than Basila. Beit Shammai, with their view, create a Heftachal Torah. This is called Elu v'elu divrelikim chayim. And the Rav went very far with this. He said that what happens in a case of a mitzvah de Rabbanan or an isa de Rabbanan, it's a rabbinic enactment. Would somebody argue that if I study Masech de Shabbos, I get a kiyum do raisa of Talmud Torah v'shinan talubanecha. But if I study Masech de Megillah or Masech de Tainis that we're studying now in the Daf Yomi, then it's only de Rabbanan. Said the Rav, no. The Rabbanon create a Heftashel Torah. And that's why we said before that although a woman is technically uh, exempt from the midst of Talmud Torah, we derive this from the Postle of Anecha, but nevertheless, a woman can create a Heftashel Torah. So let's say, for example, a woman would heaven forbid want to think Torah thoughts in a bathhouse. That would be prohibited because she can't have a Heftashel Torah in a bathhouse. Right, you have to be really uh, oriented in these, in these terms. Heftashel Torah means this is an entity. You don't see it with your eyes because it's not material. It's not like this table, which is, could be a Heftashel Shulchan, but it's some entity there called Heftashel Torah. We use the term Heftashel Torah to differentiate between the gavra, the personality, and the chefta. It could be that the personality, person, like I gave you the example of a woman or an evid, that that person is exempt personally from this, the obligation to study Torah. But if that person opts voluntarily to study Torah, they create an entity of Torah. And that entity of Torah has certain dinim to it. It can't be brought into a bathhouse, for example. You can't, into, or tefillah, for example. You can have a heftashel tefillah. It could be that I'm not obligated in prayer, but I can create voluntarily a heftashel prayer. So therefore, you would not be allowed to walk in front of me within Talad Amos because you are disturbing a heftashel tefillah. I don't know if I, if I made myself clear. A person could actually transform himself into a Heftzichel Torah. That's very fascinating. And I'll give you the context that I wanted to mention. Rav Salvechik gave a very famous eulogy for his uncle, the Brisker Rav, Rav Yitzhak Zev Halevi Salvechik. It's called Mado Dech Midot, and it's published. There are a few things about that Hesper that are very interesting but we won't go into it now. In that Hespe, he spoke about the Pasuk, Torah Tziva Lanu Moshe, Morosha Kehilas Yaakov. Moshe gave us the Torah, and the Torah is a Morosha, it's a heritage for the entire community of Israel. And the Gemara tells us, Al Tikri Morosha Ela Meurosa. 
Now here, let me just say a few words about Jewish halachic marriage. Halachic marriage, as you know, takes place in two stages. The first stage is called erisin, in which case she still lives in her, in her father's house. And then there's something called nisuin, where he takes her into his house, into the chuppah, which represents his house. And that's a more profound level of a marriage relationship. At that point, we say, Bahoyu lebasar ech, to become one. But as long as it's only Arison, that's a marriage relation. Her status is that of an Asian siege. But nevertheless, it's only in Hilchas Kinyanin. They are separate entities and separate identities. He lives in his house and she lives in our father's house. And Rav Salvechik says that within the context of one relationship to Torah, there could be two different levels of that relationship. There could be Arison on the basic level, and then there's the Suid. In Erison, a man studies Torah, and he may have acquired a tremendous wealth of Torah knowledge. He can pass any exam, but it's only Erison. He and the Torah still remain two separate entities. But then there's a higher level, a more profound level, as we spoke about before, very often Rav Salvechik, in his two dimensions, sees a surface level and a deeper level. On a deeper level, a person who studies Torah can become a nesuin with Torah. He can have a full-fledged marriage with Torah, in which case he identifies with Torah. Everything about his personality is Torah. Every thought that he thinks is a Torah thought. And here, Rav Salvation went very far. When he described his uncle, the Brisker Rav, as someone who was married to the Torah and had that unique unity with the Torah, he spoke about the following. Let's say you ask a Shiloh, you ask a question to a rabbi. The Chassam Sofer, who was one of the great giants about 150 years ago, a little bit more, but now, he used to say that when you ask me a question in Allah, I'll give you the answer before I even know logically why that answer is correct. I haven't even seen the sources. I intuitively know that this is the answer to your question. I could ask it for you immediately. And then afterwards, I'll substantiate my psaac by going through the sources, the Makoros. So Rav Soloveitchik asked, how is that possible? The answer is, if you have this Nisuin relationship with Torah, it's not just Erison, then what you become is the Nishmas Torah. You now have the Nisham of the Torah. The Torah is not just made up of hardcore facts and laws. It is a Nishama. It has its own personality. The Rav very often used to cry out, that as a Rebbe to his Talmudim in America, he felt that he was able and successful to teach them Torah and to give them a methodology of how to learn Torah, to give them a tremendous amount of knowledge. But he, feel, he felt, and he was very down about it, that he wasn't able to transmit the neshama of Torah to his Talmud. He used to cry out about Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur dominating. Yeah, we know how to do it. We can learn the Avoda. We know the Musaf service. And what went on in the Beis HaMikdash, we've learned the Sugis and Yuma. But do we feel the presence of the Shekhinah? Are we standing in the Beis HaMikdash? Do we experience the Nisham of the Torah? And he felt that he had failed to communicate and transmit that Nisham of Torah, which is the most profound level of a relationship to Torah. What is the attitude towards death? In the past, we've mentioned, especially, was it two weeks ago when we got together before Hanukkah about Rabbi Nassan, that death is just a transition from one world to another. Nothing to get too upset about. On the contrary, in a sense, histalkus at tzaddik means that the tzaddik goes even higher after death. Not so in the philosophy of Rav Salvechi. And again, if we had time, we would go through this. Rav Salvechi points out in Parshas Chukas, which is the sugya of Tumas Mes, when a person defiles himself by coming in contact with a corpse. And Rav Salvechi says, that the Torah opens up this parsha by saying, Zos Chukas HaTorah. 
And we make a mistake if we think that chukah in this context means that we don't understand the mechanism of tara, of how to be matar someone and purify him when he's contaminated and Shlomo Melech's comment and so forth and so on. He says, no, you know what the chok is? The chok here that we can't understand is death itself. And he says about death, it has a contaminating effect. Contact with death disqualifies a person from entering into the mikdash, from eating kodshim, from participating in other matters of holiness. Death is a mocking fate that awakes us, that awaits us, a trauma of human helplessness, which disturbs our existential serenity, is an absurdity, which undoes, undoes all of man's rational planning, his dreams, his hopes. And we wonder why should the foremost of God's creations, meaning man, have an awareness of his mortality, living as it were in constant dread and distress in the face of its inevitability. And in his writings about halachic man, which I have here in front of me, he says that halachic man was allergic to visiting cemeteries. He says about a whole slew, he has a whole list of gedolim, of great giants, who would never visit a cemetery unless they absolutely had to for the purpose of burying the dead. Why is that so? Because when a person goes, visits a cemetery, even if he's not a Kohen, he contaminates himself. Death. And facing death is something that brings a person down. And in this context, I want to talk to you about Rav Salvechik's attitude towards the Musser movement that we spoke about in our first lecture when we spoke about Rabbi Yisrael Salant. Rabbi Yisrael tried very hard to introduce the Musser, uh, the Musser agenda into the great yeshiva of Allah. And keep in mind, that in the mid-19th century, the mother, the greatest of all the yeshivas, was in Valosh. And at that time, the Rosh Hashiva was the Nitziv, and his grandson, by marriage, was a Rosh Hashiva, the Rav Chaim Brisker. And they could not convince Valosh to allow the study of Musar in their yeshiva. And Rabbi Yisrael's Talmud, Rabbi Itzel of Petterberg, came as a shliach to represent Rabbi Yisrael to try to convince the Rosh Yeshiva and Valoshin to introduce Musar into the curriculum of the Yeshiva. And he got a flat no, a refusal. And Rabbi Chaim explained why. And the Rav embellishes the words of Rabbi Chaim. Rabbi Chaim felt that Musa brings a person to a state of melancholy, of dark despair. In the yeshiva, in the Musa circles, they would berate themselves, they would focus on their sins and their difficulties and their iniquities and their failures. And it was something that led to to depression and to melancholy. It was famous that in certain Musa yeshivas, on Shabbos night, when the lights went, went low, they would get themselves into a frenzy of despair. And Reb Chaim said, this is antithetical to our yeshiva. And he gave the following marshal. He told Reb Itzala that if a person is suffering from difficult stomach diseases, you can give him castor oil and it will help him restore his health. But if a person is healthy and you give him castor oil, he'll get sick from it. Rav Salvechik, Rav Chaim, thank you, said that in our yeshiva, Baruch Hashem, in Valach, we're all healthy. You want to give us musr, you want to give us an agenda that's like giving castor oil to a healthy person, we'll get sick from it. And Rav Salvechik, in his halachic man, speaks about two types. Now, again, this is so typical of Rav Salvechik's application of the Briska methodology to the world of Ashkof. He speaks about there are two categories and classifications of, of relationship to the reality. One is called homo religioso, the man of religion. The other is the man of 
contemplation of analysis of science, of math. And they come with two different approaches to reality. The approach of the man of science is to try to define and classify every single phenomenon in nature and understand its essence, what causes it and what are the results of it. The homo religioso on the other hand is a man who's looking for the mysteries. He's asking the philosophical questions. And Rav Soloveitchik says that the halachic system of the halachic man is much more similar to the man of contemplation who analyzes every phenomenon in nature comes under the scrutiny of the man of halacha. He brings his a priori concepts and his definitions. And he sees whether the reality could fit into those abstract definitions. For example, a mayon, a spring, what are the dimensions of the spring? And there are a whole list of halachic considerations that will be determined by this investigation of this nature of the spring. But the homo religioso brings himself into psychic states of ecstasy, looking for that mysterious higher world. And that's antithetical to halacha. Halacha wants to take God and bring him down into this world. The Torah tells us that the Shechina came down to Mount Sinai when the Torah was given. The homo religioso, on the other hand, wants to take this world and bring it up to a higher world, to a world of, of mystery. And the Rav's of Malavrocha, time after time, would speak out against what he called religious subjectivism. When a person brings himself to a frenzy, he said, not that the halachic man has no feelings about the Torah and implementing the Torah, but it's a different kind of emotional response. It's the understanding of the halach that brings a person into that state of ecstasy and happiness and joy. It's a very profound kind of joy because it's a result of his intellectual analysis of the mitzvahs. And the Rav told us a story about his father of Moshe who once in the city of Chaslavich, which was a Lubavitch town where he was the Rav. And it was time to blow the shofar. And Rav Moshe says, Tkia, he was the Makri. And the blower broke down in tears and he couldn't get the, he couldn't blow the shofar. So Rav Moshe got angry at him. He says, and when you, when you take a lulav, do you break down and cry before you take a lulav? From Rav Moshe's perspective, forget about your religious subjectivism, your subjective feelings. And the deep meaning on a mystical level of what a shofar is all about and a cold shofar, it's a cold posture. No, leave that all out. The Torah commands you to blow the shofar. And that's what you have to do. Rav Chaim was opposed to Musa because he felt that Musa, the way it was practiced originally, back in the day, was much more similar to homo religioso. And it had to be rejected by Judaism. The Rav points out that later on, the Muslim movement took on a, took a different turn, especially with the altar of Slabodka and Nassim Finkel, and it introduced security, self-confidence, joy. You know, the altar of Slabodka didn't talk about Yeshiva Bachrim like we talk about them today. In his language, it was the Yeshiva Man because the whole purpose was to build up the yeshiva man when he was downtrodden. I'm looking at my watch to see, we don't have much time, but if you can give me five more minutes, I want to talk about sensitivity, moral sensitivity. Rav Soloveitchik never stopped talking about sensitivity and so many stories about he personally in his life reflect that sensitivity. The Rama writes, and on Purim, if you have limited funds and you have three mitzvahs, you have the mitzvah of Sudas Purim, you have the mitzvah of Mishloch Manos, Ishla Re'eu, you have a mitzvah of Matanah Slavyonim, where should you put the emphasis? And the Ramam writes, spend the money on Matanah Slavyonim. That should be first priority. Why? Because Ein Simcha Kesimcha Sa'ani. Um, Lulim, those who are downtrodden. And Rav Salvechik asked the obvious question. We're talking about the mitzvahs of Purim now. And you want to classify which mitzvah Purim, Sudas Purim, Mishloch Manos, which is primary. And the Rav 
asked, why does the Ramam focus his attention on the Simcha of the Ani? And he broke new ground by telling us that all these three mitzvahs are really one mitzvah. The Chazal established Purim as a day of Simcha. How do we achieve that Simcha? Through Suda, by giving Matanus L'Reyehu, and by giving Matanus L'Avyonim. So they're all part of one entity called Simcha. The greatest Simcha is the Simcha of the Aniyim, and that's why it gets priority. Rav Soloveitchik spoke about what's called Inui Almana. The Gemara tells us that when he took Rabbi Chal out, he was one of the Arugay Malchus, one of the martyrs. And they were about to decapitate him. And he started crying. And his colleagues asked him, why are you crying? In a few seconds, you'll be in Olam Abba. He says, I'm not crying about death. I'm crying about the way I'm being killed. Because the Torah tells us that if you afflict an, a, an Almana, then you will be killed with Cherev. And possibly I afflicted an, an almana. What does that mean? So the Medjus explains that perhaps on one occasion, Rabbi Chmuel came back after a very heavy day, working on behalf of the Jewish community, selflessness. Always, every moment. And maybe a woman came by to ask a question. And she was an almana, she was a widow. So the Shamash came to the door and he said, I can't disturb my Rebbe because he's resting now. And she shed a tear. And the thought crossed the mind that if my husband was alive, then the Rebbe would have come out personally to answer my question. Rav Soloveitchik had a student from Boston by the name of Ezra. And unfortunately, at the age of 16, he was diagnosed with Hodgkin's. He was a student in Maimonides, and Rav Salvechi used to call all the time to find out how he's doing. When the boy reached the age of 20, he came to New York to study under Rav Salvechi in his class, in his Talmud class. And Rav Salvechi was the only person in the entire room who knew how dangerously ill Ezra was. No one knew that he had to go for all these treatments. On one particular day, Ezra mentioned to Rav Salvechik that he has to leave Shir early because of the treatment that he has to go for. Rav Salvechik canceled the end of the class. He told everyone to go home. He didn't want Ezra to feel any sense of embarrassment. I don't know if you know Rabbi Kenny Brand. Originally, he was the Rav in Boca Raton. Now he's here on Aliyah, Bar Hashem. And he was the Mashamesh of Rav Salvechik for a number of years. And he tells the story that on one occasion, he was about to leave the apartment to go out and meet a young lady who turned out later on to be his wife. And he was going out on a date and the Rav looked at his feet and he was wearing sneakers and white socks. So Rav Salvech said to him, that's not the way you go out to meet a young lady. She put on dress shoes. So Kenny says to Rav Salvech, don't worry about it. You know, we already have, we've gotten past that. Our relationship is more developed. So Rav said, no, 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 no. So then Kenny said to him, but I'm wearing white socks. I can't wear white socks with dress shoes. So Rav Salvechik took him over to his drawer, opened the drawer. He says, pick a, pick a pair of socks. Rav Salvechik never wore dark socks. He only wore white socks. So Kenny, out of curiosity, said, Rebbe, you always wear white socks. How come you have this supply, a myriad supply of black socks? And you don't wear them. So Rav Salvechik explained that when his Rebbitzin had lymphoma, she was ill. It was hard for her to see. And when she was washing the socks, Rav Salvechik wanted to spare her of the difficulty of pairing black socks. You know, black socks look very similar to each other. You know, you have to really see very carefully the different patterns. So in order to spare her that feeling that she didn't know how to pair the socks, he wore white socks the sensitivity. All of Judaism is about sensitivity. And Rav Salvechik taught us that wherever we turn, we have to have a sense of closeness, of unity. Rav Salvechik used to talk about the Mishnah in Baba Kama says that if you hurt somebody, then you have to ask him for mechila. But almost an identical Mishnah appears at the end of Yoma. And there it says, Achi Ratas so Rav Salvechik asked, in one mission it says you have to ask for Mechila, 
And in the other mission, it says, Hachiratzi, you need Ritsu. And he said that that's the difference between the whole year round and Yom Kippur. The Mishnah in Baba Kama, which addresses the whole year round, then if you want to clean your record, you need Bakashas Mechila, get Mechila. But on Yom Kippur, Bakashas Mechila is not enough. You need Ritsu. You have to reestablish that close relationship that you once had before the insult. Because on Yom Kippur, we come in front of the Rebbe Shalom as a unity, as an entity, as a tzibur. And that's why Yom Kippur is called the Yom Tzom. The word Tzom in Lashon Kodesh means Tzom, a braid. We come braided together. We are all one. And we're matir to be davening with the Avar Yodim, like the Chelben and the Ketoros. In Ritz Hashem, in a week from today, I'd like to discuss with you the three great giants of ethics that we've spoken about in the last couple of weeks, Rabbi Sol Salant and the Muslim movement, Rabbi Nussan Sternhartz and the Hasidish movement, and now Rabbi Soloveitchik. And perhaps we can put things into perspective and see, first of all, an overview of each of the three and then compare and contrast. I want to just end this year again by thanking everyone for coming and joining me tonight. And also, I want to Wish that tonight's shia should be the Ili Nishmas Rebbe, Morenu for Abenu. I have to tell you, I was only in the shia for five years, but in the shia, you worked up seniority so you could move closer and closer to the road. And in the last two years, I was able to sit right next to the road. And what was the most amazing thing? You know, the road was a very dramatic speaker, very clear, crystal clear, and analytic. But for me, getting close to the table, the most amazing thing was watching the Rev's legs. It was unbelievable. It was Kolat Smolso Termarno. His whole body moved with the Torah and his legs would go up and down in a rhythm that reflected the Torah that he was teaching. Yehiza Krobaruch, we should be Zoka to learn his Torah, to be elevated by his Torah, and he to elevate us from Olam Abba, Kedir If anyone wants to stay for questions, now's a good time. I just, want to, I just want to make a comment. Uh, we were uh, privileged without any in a home right across the narrow And we were a young family had little kids and we had a new dog. The rug would walk to the mailbox on the corner mail letter. One Sunday afternoon, not another Sunday, my wife put the head for the street mailbox. My dog is attacking the road. My dog was in a wee male town, medium sized, and a young one, uh, frisky. And the road was wearing a long robe, and the dog was pulling at the robe. I ran across and got the dog away. And before I could do anything to apologize, the rub, he bends down and pets the dog. Nice dog. <laughs> that was the, the neshama of that man. Just remarkable. The rub, you know, was a split personality in this sense. In sheer, in class, he was brutal. He, you know, is very hard to live up to his standards. And he used to call on people to read the Gemara. And within seconds, he knew whether or not you understood the Gemara. So people were afraid to read the Gemara. And when he took the attendance, which he did on a daily basis, and he got to the name Schwartz, so Schwartz says he didn't come today. So the Rav said to him, all right, you read the Gemara. <laughs> and I remember a friend of ours, David Hornung, he's about six foot four. He tried to hide. The Rav loved his name. Every time he called him in the in the roll call, Hornung, he used to sing it. My name, he never got straight. Never got it straight. He used to call me Azaria. So finally, after five years, I got the guts up. I said, Revy, my name is not Azaria, it's Azaria. Oh, you mean like Rebel Ozzab and Azaria? I said, yeah, you got it. The next day, of course, he called me Azaria. But I was always thankful that he came from Boston to marry us off. My wife is here. Before we got married, I took my wife to meet him and he spent 
almost a half hour with us. Who was waiting outside was Rav Goran. He was the chief rabbi of Israel at that time. But the Rav didn't care. He wanted to spend time with a Talmud of his and his fiance. When we walked out, my wife turns to me and she said, she says, this is Rav Salvation that you're so afraid of? He's like a Zayda. <laughs> it was a split personality. Outside of Shir, it was a whole different story. He was like, you know, your best friend. But in Shia, I'll just end with one more story. This story I heard when I was sitting Shiva with my father, when I was in stitches, I was laughing. Rabbi Tabori Zechmar Lavracha, who's Mashkiach in Gush, came to be Menachem Ovel. He says to me, we were sitting in the Rav Shia, in the first row where Rav Shechter was sitting, Shechter, and behind him was Rav David Mill, and I was in the third row. That's what Tabori tells me. The Rav is looking for someone to read. To read the Gemara. You knew that he was going to put you over the coals. So just at that second, the Rav is looking at Rav Shechter. Rav Shechter's pen fell. So Rav Shechter leads over, and the Rav is looking at Rabbi Miller, David Miller. So David Miller starts leaning over like this, and now he's looking at Tabori. So Tabori goes like this, so the Rav says, what is it, bowling pins today? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Everyone should have a great week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so Thanks, much. I, I didn't know if you. No, no. I know if you. Yeah, yeah. Meetings, the place. I have before, after, but to hear it's amazing. Okay. After a serious, to catch up. So how do we get more people? It's it's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. It's okay. very nice. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much. Everything should be great. Where's Baruch? Baruch is in uh, Dubai. Oh. <laughs> with his family. Oh. Can I ask my wife to show you some pictures? He said Tuesday nights.